Hello again, everybody. Um, you know, the why is not in there because it should be obvious from that first talk of why we need to use uh, aggressive therapy when treating something so disabling and, of course, uh, so common. Um, you know, I, I liked Leon's comment about the donuts, how in the psoriasis world, you have a whole bunch of donuts, they're glazed, they're probably one with bacon on it because it's fancy and uh, hipster. You know, however, when it comes to atopic derm, for most therapies, if we're gonna make you use the donut analogy, you don't know if they're expired, you really don't know what they're gonna do for the most part. Maybe there's one that looks really good and is fresh and you, you have a expiration date on it. But it's, it's so interesting when you think in parallel, psoriasis, atopic derm, too many options, and with atopic derm, that's for psoriasis, of course, for atopic derm, we're just scratching the surface. So we're gonna talk mostly about some oldies, but still goodies, and then talk about the only FDA-approved systemic therapy for atopic dermatitis. These are my disclosures. So here are the majority of our on and off-label systemic therapies, um, on-label being literally just one of them. Um, and I'm only gonna focus uh, on, on some of these. I'm not gonna touch on azathioprine, as there have been some, some studies of late showing that there's really no difference in efficacy between azathioprine and drugs like methotrexate, which is certainly safer. So I'm not gonna spend any time on, on that one. But before jumping in to these oral uh, immunosuppressants and even immunomodulator, by show of hands, who here uses systemic steroids to treat atopic dermatitis? Show of hands. Don't be shy, it's okay. I mean, you know it's clearly a trick question, right? So systemic steroids in atopic derm, and I'd argue probably in psoriasis and a lot of inflammatory diseases, is literally a deal with the devil. Because when you start that patient on it, they are going to love you. They're gonna get better real fast, they're gonna go lift a car over their head. They're loving life. And then you start to taper them. And they're getting maybe around five milligrams, two milligrams, and their disease comes back with a vengeance. And so there is this rebound phenomenon, especially in atopic dermatitis, that is going to make these patients even worse. Forgetting even all the potential adverse events associated with using systemic steroids, um, there are really common ones, less common, but this is a pretty mind-numbing list. Now you could say, whoa, 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 this is long-term, right? We're just gonna use short little bursts, not a really a big deal. Well, there's actually some data to show that even short-term systemic steroids can have complications. But I, I don't wanna sound like a total naysayer that never, ever, ever use systemic steroids because that's not true, we do need them and they need to be purposefully used. So I think that there is an exception to every rule. And my exception here with systemic steroids is to use it as a bridge. Now you heard just before with especially some biologics, it can take time for medications to work. Methotrexate is a great example of that. These patients who literally are not sleeping, tearing their skin off and bleeding all over the place cannot wait 16 weeks for that methotrexate to kick in. So I think steroids can be used purposefully to bridge a patient as you are getting a non-steroidal on board. Um, and I typically will do anywhere between 0.75 to one mg per kg and go down anywhere from 10 to 20 milligrams per week and go down slowly. Now, there's another option, kind of a, a compromise of sorts, that you can get someone systemic steroids without giving them an oral steroid, and that's intramuscular Kenalog, um, which I'm a big fan of. Um, there's a, a nice number of studies showing that it really has no impact on HPA access. It does not have the same impact on blood sugar, hypertension. Um, certainly locally where you inject it, you can have some atrophy, some skin lightening, um, and that atrophy can run deep. But really, it, it's a nice option because you get a depot effect. You actually get the steroid coming out of the fat of the buttocks. That's typically where I do it. I know some people do it up here. I say definitely not. You're gonna get a nice big anetodermatous plaque there. Not a good plan. But the, the buttock is pretty easy, and I'll show you exactly where you need to inject, but you get the effect of that steroid usually for two to three months. So it works like an oral steroid, but you get longevity, and you typically don't get that rebound. And there's been uh, other studies looking at this, and I think there's a lot of utility. Um, you just gotta be comfortable doing it. And you need to have typically trained with someone who will say, yes, this is the right thing to do, and I try to teach all my residents, but it's pretty simple. So literally, this is all you gotta do. You need some Kenalog, and, and typically you're gonna be using about 30 to 40 milligrams in that CC, um, or a little bit less than that. I usually do one injection in each buttock, and you want the upper outer to avoid hitting the sciatic nerve. You're gonna want a, at least a one inch needle, maybe one and a half, depending on how big that booty is. And then, 
It's a true story. Um, and then you're gonna want it to be maybe a 25 to 20 gauge needle. If you try to push Ken 40 through a 30 gauge needle, you're gonna be there a really long time. Not to mention they don't come in in one inch for the most part, but you can find them, but not easily. So I think it's definitely a good option. All right, let's get into the oral immunosuppressants. Cyclosporin. If you need a drug that is going to get someone clear in like a day or two, and this is true for psoriasis also, like you have that patient, head to toe comes in and goes, by the way, I'm getting married tomorrow. <laughs> Joke's on you. Um, this will get someone clear very, very, very quickly. I typically start four to five mg per kilogram, um, and, and certainly you can apply this to pediatric dosing as well. The big things here are hypertension and, and, and renal insufficiency and, and damage. And I'll go into the kind of, uh, just like how uh, Dr. Armstrong talked about, how do you start and how do you monitor? This is definitely a very intense kind of monitoring from a lab perspective, but worthwhile when needed. Um, there are some other adverse events you can look for, peripheral neuropathy, GI, neurologic, um, and there are significant drug interactions. So this medicine is great when you need it, but this is a short-term fix because you cannot keep patients on this long-term. It's almost like an extended bridge beyond what you do for, for prednisone. Um, and definitely if someone is active infection, history of malignancy, because it itself has a black box warning uh, for, uh, for lymphoma, and uncontrolled hypertension, that's gonna be a no-no. Um, and as I mentioned also, three to four months probably, you can keep someone on it to about a year. I try not to go much longer because of the risk uh, for, for kidney disease and uncontrolled hypertension. So this is how you do it. It's a little complicated. So you're gonna order a lot of blood work before starting. You're gonna monitor them pretty regularly um, throughout the first couple months. Um, and the really big thing you're gonna look for is uh, you know, renal clearance and markers for that. Um, so this does take a lot of effort to keep uh, track of these patients. Um, but before we had an FDA approved systemic agent, we didn't really have much options. Everything was off label and this was one of our, 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 our few good quick options. Now let's say you have a patient doing well and they wanna stay on cyclosporine, you know you can't do that forever. Well, there is some data showing that weakened pulse dosing is safe longer term and still can maintain patients who are now settled down. So I do that often where I'll, I'll get someone down from everyday dosing, I'll maybe go to everyday dosing, and I've even done this in psoriasis to then just weekend dosing. So pros, it is powerful, it works fast, and it works well. Cons, a lot of side effect potential. A lot of blood monitoring for kids especially. I mean, the youngest kid I've used it in was six years of age. That's a lot of blood monitoring for a kid. So something to certainly consider. All right, methotrexate. I don't want to belabor or, or kind of be too redundant. You know, Dr. Armstrong did a great job talking about methotrexate. We know it well. Now, understudying atopic dermatitis, but it is bread and butter for us. You know, been used for psoriasis for so long, so we know what to expect. A couple small studies in AED. Um, kids usually between 0.2 to 0.6 mg per kg per week, and that's huge. Once weekly dosing, either oral or sub-Q, um, that enables better compliance. And this is where I probably will use a bridge uh, to carry a, a patient over while it's kicking in, because it could take a while to work. I also wanted to follow what Dr. Armstrong mentioned about this recent study showing we do not necessarily need to always do a test dose. That seven and a half, then 10, then 12 and a half. And you're not even in the therapeutic window. That study showed that for uh, patients who are otherwise well, no kidney issues, you can start at 15 and work up from there. And that makes a big difference. So the how, it's listed here. This is from the AAD. Similarly, a lot of blood work. Initially, you'll be checking labs pretty regularly, predominantly looking at CBC. Um, and obviously, you wanna make sure they're taking their folic acid every day. It's been shown you don't have to skip the day where they take it. Um, but you will be, once again, monitoring these patients pretty closely. When you get to a stable dose, however, you don't have to be so diligent. Now, I, I also don't wanna repeat this. We used to suggest a liver biopsy. It actually was much lower than this. It was at like one and a half grams, and it keeps getting pushed higher and higher, and now really the recommendation is an ultrasound. There are some blood tests as well that you can do. So benefits, uh, it's an immunosuppressant we know and hopefully love. We have a lot of experience with it, once a week dosing. The monitoring is not as crazy as it comes to when you think about cyclosporin, and certainly safer long-term. Patients can take this for years, but definitely monitor the dose over time, the cumulative dose. Other pearls safe in children, it's been used in children, but there are some important drug interactions. Whatever you do, do not give it with Bactrim. Bad news bears, you will potentially kill that patient. Um, doxycycline, another drug we use commonly, will actually mess with renal clearance of methotrexate. So you cannot, it sounds like a great idea, combine anti-inflammatory doxy or tetracycline uh, with, um, with methotrexate, bad idea. Mycothin and mofetil. So, before the advent of biologic atopic derm, this was my go-to, because I think of this as like the, uh, the kind of very, very smiley and chubby chick, 
cheek little brother of immunosuppressants for atopic dermatitis. Probably the least kind of damaging and, and, and least invasive from a lab monitoring perspective of all the immunosuppressants. Um, pretty easy to use, um, standard dosing, hard to mess up, and it works pretty well. I, I was a more of a methotrexate guy uh, when I was in the Bronx, and I moved more to mycophenolate when I moved down to GW. The big side effects, GI, certainly can happen. GU is listed as the most common, but I typically don't see urinary urgency with this. Um, there's an enteric coated form that's very expensive that helps with the GI side effects. Um, and you do need to monitor labs, but it's not as crazy. There are some nice kind of case series looking at efficacy, and my hands has worked very well. Uh, and actually, when dupilumab first came out, which is what I'm going to end with, um, I, I had a lot of patients on Celsept that I transitioned from Celsept onto dupilumab. So baseline labs, a lot less invasive than with the others. Follow-up labs, not as common, you know, not as frequent, you know, every two weeks for a month, and then really goes down to every quarter, every three months. So pros, easier to use, safer. It doesn't wipe out the immune system. There's a salvage pathway in terms of its mechanism that doesn't knock out all immune cells. So these patients can mount an immune response, but you still knock out the cells you really want to go after. Azotretin's not immunosuppressant, but it has been used for decades, and I think there is a place for it in the eczema world, more for hand-foot dermatitis. Um, and I think it does work really well, really well for chronic hand dermatitis. Um, it is the uh, metabolite of atretinate. If you drink on this, it will turn to atretinate and live in you for God knows how long. The limiting factor is that we can't really use this, or it's very hard to use in women of childbearing years. If someone's on this, they should not get pregnant for up to three years after stopping. That is very rate limiting for women of childbearing years. Um, side effects, dry skin, hair loss, waxy palms at higher doses. But it does work. This is one of my patients, um, and you can see the spongiotic vesicles on the foot here, and just two months of 20 milligrams a day had a, a pretty nice impact. Um, so start low and kind of work up pretty quickly. Um, you do want to check, uh, actually historically we said CBC, I don't even do that anymore. I follow more of the isotretinoin guidelines. Um, and then you want to check every couple months, LFT and triglycerides and lipid panel really is what you want to follow um, because it certainly can bump those up, uh, but really an easy drug to use. And as I said, I really use it for more hand foot disease. What about itch? So as I mentioned earlier, antihistamines really don't work here. Histamines are not part of the problem. So I more go after the nerves. I use anti-anxiety uh, medications, antipsychotics, anti-epileptics. My probably my lead is gabapentin, but though now it is a controlled substance. So if you don't have a two-step authentication system in your EMR, you'll have to actually physically write or print out a prescription. I also use a lot of pregabalin, both very effective at controlling the itch of atopic dermatitis. I also use a lot of mirtazapine and occasionally a prepotent, which is a neurokinin receptor antagonist. So just say no antihistamines, it'll make them drowsy, especially in kids that can affect development, and it really does not work well, unfortunately. So I do love the oldies, but I'm certainly excited about some new stuff. And really the only new medication we have uh, in our hands is dupilumab, which is a monoclonal antibody to interleukin-4 receptor that has a two-for-one deal that by blocking that receptor, you block no surprise, IL-4, but also you block IL-13 because the IL-13 receptor needs to come together in holy matrimony with the IL-4 receptor to do anything. And you block that receptor, you can't do much of anything. And it'll block a lot of those things I talked about before during the lunch lecture. So just to use a case as an example, patient was sent to me for psoriasis, for narrowband UVB, because the biopsy showed, which that great question before, psoriasiform spongiac dermatitis with neutrophils, this was actually atopic dermatitis with impetigenization. So it was a misdiagnosis. And looking at the clinical, this doesn't look like psoriasis. Ill-defined, thin pink plaques. You see some lichenification at the wrist. Still ill-defined. This is atopic dermatitis misdiagnosed. And so this patient got on dupilumab, and just two months later, substantial improvement to the point that she was proud to say she was wearing low v-necks, which sounds silly, but to her was actually very meaningful because she wore very often turtlenecks even during the summertime. So we just uh, fortunate to have some open label extension data, three year data, which to me, the main thing when it comes to OLE data is longevity, both from an efficacy standpoint and a safety standpoint. I'm not gonna dive deep into the data. What I'm just gonna say is that those people who responded continue to respond over time. And there are no new safety signals beyond what we saw with original clinical trial data. So exactly what you want to see with open label extension, no surprises, no ups and downs, but really consistent impact. 
I highly recommend you print out the dosing regimen because there is weight-based dosing for the adolescent and pediatric um, patients. Um, adults and uh, adolescents above 60 kilograms, it's the same. 300 milligrams, two syringes, so 600 total at day zero, and then, th uh, and th and then you kind of go, go beyond. Um, actually, I take that back. So adults is 300 every two weeks, and then this is every two weeks for 600 for 60 or more. Um, and then, you know, for younger kids, it could be sometimes be once a month, which certainly is amenable for, um, you know, for younger kids in terms of having needle phobia. Safety, so like all biologics, injection site reactions are certainly number one. So expect to talk to patients about it, it does happen. Conjunctivitis is the big one. I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and then keratitis is the scariest one, though I've not heard of any post-marketing um, cases of that actually happening. Um, so with conjunctivitis, it happens, it's real. Tell patients about it. And we think that it's, it's unique to atopics because in the nasal polyps and the, um, uh, in the asthma cohorts, we didn't really see it. So it's probably something to do with that these patients, roughly 25% of moderate severe atopic derm patients already have eye itching. They've been rubbing, that's why you get those shiners. So there's already some injury. Then you block IL-4 and that affects goblet cell formation and maturation. So it's kind of a double whammy, the eyes dry out. But when it happens, it's mild to moderate, it's well controlled. Um, and only one out of 920 patients in the clinical studies actually backed out because of that. Now, what do I do? So I always ask, do you have a history of eye itching? If they say yes, they are getting artificial tears from the get-go. And I've seen a drastic reduction, and this is me speaking, a drastic reduction of the uh, numbers of conjunctivitis, which actually at this point since I started that had been zero since I started doing that. But if it does happen, you can use cyclosporin drops, you can use topical steroid drops. It's usually mild to moderate and you can power through. It's rare these patients actually have to stop. What about keratitis? Well, this is a medical emergency. It is eye redness, sudden pain, double vision, photophobia. If this does happen, which I've said I've never seen it, they go directly to the ophthalmology. Do not pass go, do not collect $200, okay? Now there's some other rare adverse events. There's this facial redness that really is like two flavors. There's facial redness that looks like, um, that looks like rosacea and you treat it as such. And then there's facial redness that really more fits with something more eczematous. So it's important to kind of separate these, those two because the treatment will be, um, be a little different. Um, it's rare though, I've seen only a handful of cases. Who here has seen that? Like the almost facial erythema, like almost persistent erythema of rosacea. Yeah, a handful. It happens. It is not a game changer. It's not a game stopper, but just be aware of it. It's good to talk to patients about it. Um, in terms of infection, remember, these patients all are at higher risk for all types of infections. And post-marketing studies have shown that there's a reduction of infection in patients with moderate severe disease who are on DUPI versus not on DUPI. It makes sense because if you're stopping that inflammatory milieu from suppressing the innate immune response, your first line of defense, then it can function correctly. It can fight off and ward off those invaders. And so infection rates do go down. Practicals get it covered. It's all about documentation. You gotta document their IgA and EZ. You're not gonna do this, let's be real. You're not gonna do this in your practice because you will get really behind. But my advice is know what was the entry point for the clinical trials, those numbers to put in your note. On the flip side, you get it approved. Yay, they're on it. Document success. If they're always an IG three or four throughout time, guess what? The insurance is going to say, it's not working. Take them off of it. There are a lot of really great tools. The AD is this prior authorization tool that generates a letter. It is magnificent. will save your staff time. Um, and always ask for samples because you can get a patient started like that because there's no pre-treatment labs or monitoring. So very easy to get someone started in the office. And how do you know you're being well controlled regardless of what you're using? You gotta ask the patient. Always ask the patient. Lots of easy questions because it's not just about knowing how the patient's doing and partnering with them. Documenting this will help you get things covered. How miserable are they? That is something you wanna share with the insurances because that sometimes is the, makes the turning point for getting approvals. So you gotta document or else. What about those patients who are flaring before their next shot? Well, that OLE data was very helpful. I'm gonna give a shout out to Joe who pointed me in the direction of this data that actually there was a cohort of patients who were on weekly dosing that did really well. And this data can actually help you get weekly dosing, which is not FDA approved for those, um, who, those who need it, who start to flare by the end of those two weeks. 
So my final statement is get pumped. We have a very robust pipeline of new drugs targeting those intricate elements of the pathophysiology of this very complex disease. And so it'll be very much like Leon's donut bowl, where we'll have a lot of delicious smelling, moist, succulent donuts, rather than the uh, kind of stale and parasite infested uh, donuts we previously had in the atopic dermatitis world. Thank you so much for your attention.